preparation, patience, and purpose. Preparation, patience, and purpose. I'm never fully prepared. I never have enough patience. And I'll always be wondering about my purpose. Unless the preparation in my life is done by God in his patience for his purpose. Today is a day that I need his preparation all day long. I need his patience all day long to fulfill his purpose in my life. I challenge you today to walk in the preparation of God in his patience and fulfill his purpose. The passage before us today, Acts chapter 9, 19 through 31, explains those three things in our lives. Paul went through preparation with God's patience to fulfill God's purpose. There's only 13 verses we're going to look at with the exception of a couple of sidebar verses. And in those 13 verses, it covers five to six years in the life of Paul. So it's like an aerial view of his life. You'll remember Paul was on the road to Damascus. Jesus met him there in the previous verses of Acts chapter 9. Starting at 19b on your handout, then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ, the Messiah, in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for the purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. Paul's purpose, like our purposes sometimes, are radically changed by God. God had in his mind a certain preparation in his patience, God's patience, to bring Paul to a new purpose. Not a purpose to destroy the church, but a purpose to expand the church. Paul immediately preaches the Son of God. Notice in verse 21, they were, they were amazed. That's a word that means they were stopped dead in their tracks. Similar how Paul was stopped dead in his tracks. On the road to Damascus, suddenly... He's preaching a message that stops the Jews dead in their tracks because his purpose had been changed by the power of God. Verse 22, but Saul increased all the more. Well, let me back up. I got to finish verse 21. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not the one? Is this not he who destroyed those? And the priests wanted to have all the believers bound to Jerusalem. Verse 22, but Paul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus proving that Jesus was the Christ. So verse 20, he's talking about the Messiah, the Son of God. Verse 22, he's confounding them. 
The word amazed meant being stopped in your tracks. Confounded is an interesting term. It's a term from cooking. It's as if you're cooking this beautiful cake and you reach out for some vanilla to pour in that cake mix. And you don't look at the label very well. You grab that bottle and you pour it in. And then when the cake is done, you realize it was vinegar. <laughs> what a shock. Confounded is when everything is going according to the recipe and somebody drops something else in it. Paul is dropping something into the theology of Judaism, the theology of the rabbis. He's dropping the Mashiach of Israel, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and he's doing it in such a way that is powerful. He's proving the Messiah to them. So I want to pick it up at verse 23, and on your handout I have three things that we see from the passage in Paul's life that was preparing him for ministry. Now remember, I started the message with the three things I want to emphasize through the message. Preparation, patience, and purpose. But there are three things that we're working in Paul's life. Here they are. Letter A, time alone with God. Letter B, a learning through adversity. And letter C, growing through body life. Between verse 22 and verse 23, which starts out, now after many days were passed. Many of you know this. That somewhere between Damascus and Jerusalem, that Paul went to what we call the backside of the desert. And he was there for three years. I have the Galatians 1, 17 and 18, where he talks about it. But I went up to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem. Was he three years in the desert, three years in Damascus? Scholars have argued over those points for years. It's not that important. What's important was that Paul took time to be alone with God. How many of like you how many of you like alone time? How many of you like being alone? There is a danger spending alone time without God. Now you think on that. If you don't invite God into your alone time, you're going to be binge watching television for hours. You're going to be eating half gallons of ice cream. You're going to be snacking on bags of potato chips. You're going to be on the phone gossiping. I don't know. Go down the list. Alone time is great. But the goal is alone time with God. Many of you in this room live alone. And there's nothing the matter with that. I want you to know that even though you live alone, you're not alone. It's impossible to walk into a room that God is not there first. Think about that for a moment. Sometimes we get fear. You can't walk into a room that God is not there first. Add a little under letter A, that last bullet point. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 34. Blessed is the man that hears me, watching daily at my gate, waiting at the post of my doors. 
Hearing, watching, waiting. Hearing, watching, waiting. This describes what a daily alone time with God should look like. God will bless you as you do this. So Paul spent this alone time. Let's pick it up at verse 23. And we're going to learn about adversity. How many have ever been through adversity? A few. How many have never been through adversity? How many are just too weak to raise your hand this morning? <laughs> now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Now, he's still in Damascus. But their plot became known to Saul. And they watched the gates day and night. Have you ever had anybody watch your gates day and night? Hmm? Who's watched your gates day and night? A father when you were a teenager? A mother? Maybe you were the one doing the watching, you know? A boss? Someone in the church? Is somebody watching your gates to do harm to you, to cause gossip? Sometimes the best response is no response at all. Not every time. But in this time, it seems strange. Verse 25, Then the disciples took him by the night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. Was he running away? Was he a coward? No way. He was living to fight another day. He was living to fight another day. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, have it on your handout, letter B, lifelong adversity. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Whenever you feel like you've been through adversity, when it's been tough for you, I want you to use this chapter as a checkbox list, comparing your life with Paul. Now, we're not going to compare each other with each other, but I think Paul's a good benchmark for us. Paul says in verse 22, comparing himself with the Hebrews and others, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are the seed of Abraham? So am I. So he sends his credentials. Verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Now here's the list. In laborers more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequently. In deaths often. I know of at least... Once that Paul died, was raised from the dead when he was stoned. Verse 24. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I have been in the deep, verse 26, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils driving around Laguna Woods. Now, I'm not talking about any of you, of course. Verse 27. In wearings and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. I love this. He gives us a long list of all the things he's been through. And look at what he says in verse 20. And besides all of that, I had to worry about you guys. Oh, look at it. Verse 20. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all of the churches. 
Verse 29, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble? I do not burn with indignation. Verse 30, if I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. In Damascus, now this is referring to where we are in Acts chapter 9. In Damascus, the governor under Artus, the king, was guarding the city of Damascus with a garrison desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. No, Paul was not a coward. Paul gloried in suffering for Christ. It's an amazing account of his life, how he does that. So Paul spent time alone with God. Paul learns to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit through adversity. And let her see on your handout. Paul learns body life. Verse 26. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him. Now, this is almost 60 years later. I mean, for sure they had all heard about the wonderful and powerful things that Paul had done and preached, but they were still afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas... Look over to your handout, letter C, number one. Is there a Barnabas in your life? His name means son of prophecy or son of consolation or exhortation. He was a giver and the forerunner of care ministries within the church. Romans 12, 8 lists exhortation, which Barnabas' names mean, as a spiritual gift. And Barnabas is an example of that. Coming back to the text in verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and he declared to them how he, he, Paul, had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly. Three things I have them highlighted there. Paul, or Saul as his name is called now, he saw the Lord, he spoke to the Lord. Those were the criteria for being an apostle. And then he spoke boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming and going. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord. I love this. We all need a Barnabas in our life at one time or another. I've had several Barnabases that have come along in my life at just the right time, at just the right moment. To speak on my, half, on my behalf or to go before me boldly in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now in this threefold preparation, patience and purpose, we get to an age in our life sometimes when we think, I'm done pre being prepared. If I'm not prepared by now, I'm never going to be prepared. But that's not the way it works. Is it? As long as I have breath, if I'm not dead, I'm not done. I can't tell you the number of people in our congregation that I've seen go home to Jesus from a bedroom on hospice or from a hospital room that has not led a nurse, hospital worker, 
janitor, to Jesus Christ. I cannot imagine of any greater thing than on my way to heaven, I bring a few people with me. How many of you would like to do that? Okay, well, you don't wait till you're at the end of your life to do that. Every day is a preparation for that. Every day as I share my faith in Jesus Christ, if you spend a whole life not talking about Jesus or sharing him with other people, you're not going to do it on your deathbed. You're going to be thinking about you or worrying about you. <laughs> oh, man. I won't give you the names of some of these folks, but... On their deathbeds, they were not thinking of themselves. They were praying for others. Some prayed for me. I came to pray for them, they prayed for me. By the way, Pastor, this is Jane. I just led her to the Lord yesterday. Does that ever touch my heart? I hope it touches your heart. Now, I know these people. These were not deathbed conversions of, of other people because their whole life was a pattern of being prepared each day to share their faith in the patience of God working it in them for his purpose. So, Paul was preaching, the Hellenists, which were Greek-speaking Jews, got all upset, attempted to kill him. Verse 30, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him to Tarsus. That was his hometown. That's at the end of five to six years from the start of this passage. Verse 31, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edifying. Now, some people think that's because Paul left. No, not. it wasn't because Paul left. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. They had peace and were edified because of the last phrase. They were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Three things in Paul's life that prepared him. He spent time alone with the Lord. He responded to adversity and he kept connected to the body of Christ, to the church. Those are three things that you and I need to do every week. Was Paul, excuse me, was Jesus patient with Paul. <laughs> all the years that he spent under Gamaliel, all the years he spent persecuting the church. Many of us, if we are alive at that time, we would say, I wouldn't mind if Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus and just struck him dead, you know? Take that person out of my life. Have them just trip over an acorn or a walnut and crack their head, you know? Don't get them born again, not that. Every person I see has a need. Every person I see needs prayer. Can't pray for all of them, but I can pray for the ones that God sent me or sends me to. Will you walk in his preparation for you today? Will you walk in his, will you, will you be as patient as God is? I can't be. That's why I have to depend on his patience. Man, he's patient for you. He knows all about you. We stand in front of the microwave and say, hurry up. We have no patience. Prepared, 
in patience for his purpose. Heavenly Father today, I pray each person here, including myself and in the sound of my voice, that you would help us to accept and walk in your preparation for us. That we would accept the grace of your patience to fulfill your purpose. Most of all, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, open your heart, receive him now. Oh Lord Jesus, come into my life. I confess my sins to you. Cleanse me, heal me. I repent of my sin. Lord, for all of us that have struggled with patience, purpose, being prepared, prepare in us, O oh Lord, a clean heart today. Prepare in us a clean mind. Lord, we commit never to be alone unless it's alone with you. Grant us your grace and your purpose today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand together.